Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ask MNLCT. Um, today, um, we have a very interesting uh, hot topic in the media, which uh, we all love and we all hate, quote unquote. <laughs> Not really, I'm just, um, we all love the media. We are the media. Um, so before I start, I would like to just pay my respects um, to the land that we own, to the people who, uh, um, who this land originally belonged to. Um, so, and it gives me a great honor to acknowledge that the land that we're meeting on today um, is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'm based in the Halton region. Um, so this is the traditional territory of many nations, including uh, the Anishinaabek, uh, Hurun Wendat, Hadinasani, uh, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Matisse people. Uh, this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Um, as from a personal point of view, uh, and with a very open heart, um, the ancestors of this land have welcomed newcomers, have welcomed me, my family, um, like they've welcomed uh, many generations for thousands of years. And I, the least I can say is I'm humbled and grateful to be here in form and in spirit. If there's anything to learn from this journey is that we give love and honor our mother nature as she has bestowed life and love to all living things, past and present and obviously in the future. So um, thank you very much. Um, I also wanna to thank today um, the panelists uh, for making it here. Um, today's show, before I start, is focused on the, um, the changing media, the evolving media. So we all know that over the years, um, we've all witnessed, as you know, you don't need uh, anyone to tell you, but we've seen how newspapers have become leaner, uh, publications folded. Uh, we've seen advertising agencies squeeze their budgets or clients squeeze their budgets. Um, there's been consolidation, there's been, um, the uh, a dynamic shift in, in this market um, across the world, not just here. Um, and while we've seen a lot of digital media growth, we've seen a lot of uh, maybe new channels, online radio stations, television programs, even stations, there's like uh, probably tons, uh, thousands across the world, uh, especially with satellite TV. Um, there's too many pieces of that <laughs> of, of the cake to share or that pie. So um, it gets quite confusing. And if you're a newcomer and this is your passion, you've been working in the media, it's, um, it's overwhelming, right? You don't know where to start. You don't know what to invest your time in. Do you carry on uh, being a journalist? Do you change? So um, today I'm very, um, again, humbled to welcome uh, Richard Landau, who is, um, he's a well-known figure. He doesn't need much introduction. Uh, he's a media specialist, a college professor. Uh, he's also an instructor on our um, BEMC program. This is one of um, our um, MNLCT's um, uh, media programs, which uh, it's a bridging program. It's called Bridge to Employment in Media and Communications. Um, and uh, Richard heads that alongside Daniel Wong, who is also part of our group. Uh, he's the a program, um, uh, he's part of the program and he's a media and communications career developer. He has a lot of experience in, in coaching. Uh, he's a natural coach, I would say, but he's also a professional one too. So um, having both of you here today, we uh, can't thank you enough. Um, thank you for being here, Richard. Uh, I'll, actually, I wanna start with you, Daniel. If you can give us a, a brief, for those who don't know what the BEMC program is about, uh, maybe just give us a, a brief background on that and how that is beneficial to um, newcomers who want to invest their uh, careers in, in media. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm still getting used to that. After a year of pandemic, still getting used to this. <laughs> Always can use the practice. Uh, thank you, Miles, for, for having me on the program today. So I am the um, career and employment specialist for the Bridge to Employment 
community communications program at Menon New Life Center. Uh, this program is a bridging program designed for internationally trained professionals who have previous work experience in media communications from outside of Canada. Um, the, the program aims to do a few key things to prepare uh, newcomers to work by helping them to learn about the uh, media and the communications industry, the local one, especially in Ontario, which is where our, our program is, is hosted. Our program is also available for anyone in Ontario. We are delivered virtually now, 100% since the pandemic started. Um, it is a, a six and a half month program. It serves to help people understand the local media industry to make connections and to network with professionals and peers and mentors in the industry to help them adapt to the cultural norms, especially in the workplace, um, and to help them integrate to work through um, the work placements that are made available to um, participants in the program. So I do, I teach employment preparation. I've been an employment coach for, for almost 10 years. Um, I, I teach one of the programs in employment. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I arrange for the work placements for our, our participants. And so it's been a joy working with Miles um, and Richard, which is Richard is one of our founding instructors of the program. So it's great to, always great to see both of you again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick note there for um, um, our audience who were listening today, uh, who joined us. Um, so this session will be recorded and um, will also be uh, uh, posted online on YouTube. So we'll uh, send out uh, more information on that. But I just want to let you know that uh, this is an open um, session. So you're free to ask questions at any time uh, through the, you can use the chat. We prefer the uh, Q&A or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute uh, um, you and then you can speak and ask a question to any, uh, any one of us. Um, so feel free to do that at any point in time. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I, I just wanted to ask you, so there is, uh, um, I know you have two cohorts usually a year. Um, there's one, you're, you're, you're in the process of, um, uh, there's a of, of finalizing one and there's another one coming up, I, I guess in a couple of months, right? Yes, we deliver the program twice a year. And our next program starts in the spring, as it usually does. The start date is still pending, but we are aiming for like mid to late April start. Um, and we usually have, you know, 20, 22 people in, in, in the program for each cohort. Um, we still have a lot of um, space for enrollment now. And uh, so please, if you are, you know, if you have the prior work experience, in media and communications, whether you're a journalist or writer or marketing or public relations, or if you're a digital you know, designer um, or producer um, and new to Canada or been here for a while, but you know, having trouble getting started because it's a very tough industry to crack, please get in touch with us. Uh, we offer information sessions every two weeks. We have um, our next one next week, the first week of March. Um, and we can provide information how to register on Eventbrite um, later on. I think Miles will distribute that information, but we're still looking for students and participants. Um, so it's, it's a very effective program. It will definitely help people uh, meet a lot of people in the industry and get really prepared yourself in this industry, which is really, really tough to get into on your own. And we provide as much guidance and resources um, and opportunities that you won't find anywhere else. Absolutely. All right, so uh, we, we hope to have you. No, thank you, Daniel. I know you have a few announcements to make, so we leave that till the end. Uh, there's some additions to the program that's very uh, exciting. So um, we'll come back uh, and, and talk more about that. But in the, um, I wanna just jump into the topic. Um, Richard, uh, you, I mean, you've seen, uh, you've seen how the media has changed uh, globally and around and here. And I've, heard you, um, you know, um, I, you know, I was, I was privileged to take a class uh, and, 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 you know, learn a lot about, about the industry. Um, to you, what do you, for, for, for newcomers who are listening in today um, and who want to pursue, uh, you know, who have a career in media and who come here, but they land and don't know what to do. Is it, 
encouraging? Uh, what 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 would advice would you give them? How do you how would you lay the um, you know the situation to them? You're you're muted, Richard. Briefly, then, let me say that we uh, are at an unusual time, and that to begin with. The advance of digital media at the expense of traditional media has been rapid uh, and so much so that the federal government here actually set aside money to encourage local media initiatives um, people to start them etc um, then you add on top of it the pandemic what does that mean well the model that most of our media operate under those that's all those that are not publicly fund, uh, funded funded by government is that we basically want to capture eyeballs or ears or readership and then turn that over to advertisers. That's part of the model that makes it work. So your newspaper is supported by advertising or your on-site is supported by advertising. But when the people who typically advertise their businesses have been put on hold because of the lockdown, they don't advertise. And so now we have the double whammy in the media. So just understand that we're in this setting where, I mean, I used to, my favorite, the media job search site, I used to go there and, and every week there'd be six pages full of jobs. We're now down to about one and a half. So I don't want to discourage you because there are jobs. You just got to know how to find them. But we are living in uh, right now, temporarily, straightened circumstances. To this, uh, the, one of the hopeful signs is that the Australian government the Australians must be brave, have pushed back against Google and pushed back against Facebook and said, no, the model isn't working and we need a model that's going to work for Australians and Australian journalism. And so they didn't have to push very hard, it seems to me, at least from what I see of it. And immediately News Corp, which is an Australian based, originally Australian based Rupert Murdoch's, Rupert Murdoch's organization, they struck a deal with Google. And the government struck a deal with Facebook and with um, the Seven Network. And so suddenly we're now seeing a sharing of revenue or a collection of revenue so that traditional media does not die, which is really important. Into this comes a new journalist, a young journalist. And that in this situation and under these circumstances, there are certain tools and skills you are going to need to excel above others to, to find work that when you walk into an employer and you say i've got this this and this they will perk up and they will listen to you i, I don't know if you want me to cover that now or we can get to that later but certainly there is a certain skill set that's going to be required in this changed circumstance yeah no interesting uh i actually a few good points you made there i um about the skills let's delve that into that for a second because um you have, uh, I mean, you have the traditional media, people seem to think that because traditional media is dying, the whole industry is dead, right? Now you have all these citizen journalists. Um, no one wants to read long feature articles, a thousand word article. That's, you know, that long, are, you know, long gone are the days where I used to, you know, hold up a newspaper and read it from, um, you know, page, front page to back, back page. But, and, and you just want snippets, right? And the habits have changed. The uh, mindset has changed. So, from a, from someone who's working in the media, they th if you don't like if you haven't accepted the digital age or you're not tech savvy, right? Um, because you're more creative and you want to invest your time, um, you know, uh, in, in 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 the creativity part rather than the tech part. Where do you fit in, or how do you fit in? I think the greatest skill that anyone can bring to this right now. Uh, is the ability to synthesize vast sums of information, vast quantities of information. That's something that they don't normally teach you in school, but the ability to read a number of documents and synthesize the discussion is going to become even more important than it is now. That's number one, the ability to synthesize vast sums of information. Number two is thinking in three dimensions, so to speak, thinking in a multimedia way. So if you're a print journalist, you need to be thinking about how will this look in a photograph? How will this look on the website? Being able to, if you're a writer, write for the web as, as well as write for print and write for the ear, for radio or TV. 
So if you can adapt those skills, one of the things we teach in the program actually, is how to write for these different media, you'll be valuable. Someone, you'll say to someone, well, you'll walk into an interview, I know how to write for radio as well as write for print. Yeah, because a lot of things are now going live. So that would be one of the things, though a couple of things that would make you very valuable to an organization. In addition, uh, vast general knowledge is great. One of the things we find lacking with journalists typically is, for example, an understanding of mathematics. There's a story about homelessness in New Zealand. And one major news organization said there were about 40,000 homeless in New Zealand. And they said that's 10% of the population. So let me tell you something. If you get 10% homeless in any nation, virtually the economy will collapse. That's a, that's a disaster. So I looked at that and went, that's not right. And I knew New Zealand had a 4 million population, about 4.6. 1%, not 10%. Somebody couldn't do the math. Yeah, they didn't do their homework. <laughs> so, so those are a couple, a couple of things that are required. I would say what is also going to become increasingly important, my last point here is the ability to take yourself out of your writing. And don't give me your opinion, just give me the facts. And I can talk to you about some language and some words later on, I will, that people use and they immediately show me they've got a bias. They've got a prejudice and there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on that. I, I predict in the coming months and years. Right. So I, I live in Milton and exactly three weeks ago, um, you know, we got the Milton champion here, um, which is part of the larger group, right. Um, uh, of, of newspapers and the, uh, the, the cover was, uh, was a, it was just a blank cover and it was taken by news media and did it deliberately that, Hey, you know, this industry, we're suffering, we're not making money, um, et cetera. You know, the, you know, the story and, um, and they're calling on, on, uh, for help. Like, you know, we've, we've been talking about this. We've been raising the red flag for ages now, but who's doing what about this? I know we talked about this earlier, how the government pledged to, uh, inject $600 million into, um, reviving the industry. Um, but when I went in, not much, not much has been written about that. Uh, there's been complaints, but you don't know what's happening, where the funds are going. And apparently it's not all going to revive just the, a particular media sector. Um, what I want to find out if, if, if that money is going, is being channeled somewhere, how can um, say the ordinary media enthusiast who wants to start his own company or or want to work somewhere, how can he or she benefit from that? Or can they benefit? Um, well, the, the, first of all, you might want to talk in Canada, talk to your local member of parliament and, right. and, and get their endorsement before you start applying for the funds. That would be useful. The other thing is that the ministry, uh, culture heritage, um, I would talk, I, whatever they're calling themselves this year, because they changed their name, but ministry of heritage, I would talk to them because that's where the, the where the funds are uh, and look at the guidelines very carefully. And I, if we can do this after this meeting, uh, I, I will provide you with a link and everybody who's online can, can get the link to the actual site, and read it for themselves, what they're eligible, uh, whether whether they're eligible or not. There seems to be a particularly strong focus on local news because local news is drying up. You know, nobody really makes money. Well, Fox makes money, but not a lot of people make money doing news. CTV, I don't know if they make a lot of money with their news. I think they probably break even or lose money, but they have to because it's part of their license. Um, the CBC isn't about making money, so we won't use them in, in this argument. But generally speaking, people covering news and radio and television, if it's part of what they do, it's a money losing part of what they do. Right. So I think the effort here is to reestablish an equilibrium. Now, to be fair, a lot of people said, I'm not taking government money. I'm not, I'm not. If I take government money, they're going to dictate, you know, how I cover stories. Well, to the credit of our, our democratic system, I don't know too many cases where the government stepped in and told someone they have to do something or they won't get money. But there is always that danger. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I wanted to actually, um, a point I wanted to segue into mm -hmm. is where would you, would you recommend... Um, people starting their own businesses in the media or getting employed? And in what sort of mediums, what, what, what are the hot mediums at the, 
is it is it like would you say tv newspapers digital uh, aggregators well you know about a year ago i would have said make a podcast but everybody's got a podcast now right Every, everyone has a podcast if you're telegenic if you come across well on camera if you've done tv or if you've really got something to say podcast ain't bad if you can do an audio podcast as like this guy tim harford does one for in the in the uk and he tells it he knows how to tell a story that's mm. a big big ability to tell a story so he tells his story one i heard was about david bowie uh the late he recently passed away um yeah. Keith jarrett Keith Jarrett was doing his famous Cologne concert, Cologne concert, yep. and the piano, they had a lousy piano that night. Where were they going to get a good piano? And he tells his whole yarn. It was so fascinating, I couldn't stop listening. So storytelling is one place where there's going to be opportunity. I'm sure Daniel knows more about where the opportunities are. Um, I said to one of our graduates, he was going through the program, I, I discovered his interest was in sports. and. The sports mm -hmm. from his home nation. A lot of people he here in North America play that sport, mm -hmm. but there's not much information about it. So, so why don't mm -hmm. you start a podcast or a blog about that? Apparently, he's been quite successful. Mm -hmm. So, I think cross cultural works really, really well. Number one, number two, being adaptable. So, if you start uh, a blog, and let's say you decide you want to turn it into a, a podcast, you, you move to audio, then you move to video. Being adaptable is critically important. Where are the opportunities? One of the big opportunities, which perhaps we can take up a little later, is in what's called collaborative journalism. And collaborative journalism is, for example, if you belong to a community, let's say your community is like airplane watchers, I don't know, I'm making things up, or the people of the nation of X, <coughs> being able to bring that into a newsroom and say, you know, like I've been in newsrooms where, um, a story breaks in India and nobody here knows how to cover it. They don't know what the story is. Why didn't we have somebody of Indian extraction in the newsroom in the first place? So that's obviously an opportunity for people who have uh, collaborative journalism where they have another medium or another subject or another topic that they're familiar with. I'll, I'll say more later. Yeah, I want to talk about those media and, and, and you know, um, uh, and how, you know, um, uh, on how you can maximize uh, mm -hmm. And look into online revenues but i just want to jump to um uh, get your opinion daniel uh, or your point of view uh, you've seen a lot of um students go through these uh, this program your bemsi program and the the i guess the, the big advantage about this is that um is the placement element and which is quite successful um can you tell us what sort of industries you're placing these students what sort of um companies are open to uh, welcoming placement students and um, tell us more about that. Yeah, the placement part is um, really the second part of our, the comp major component of our program. The first component is the courses and then which Richard contributes to. And then the, um, the integration component is the work placement, integration into, you know, the working. So, so media and communications, we have, there's so many lanes or streams, whatever you call it. Um, you know, media communications is the big umbrella, but we support people in journalism and in writing. That's broadcast news, that's web news. Um, so it's a virtual, uh, traditional news and more like virtual news. People in marketing, public relations, um, you know, uh, media purchasing, um, digital design, that includes the graphic designers, um, web designers, you know, things like that. And, um, we look for placements. We do our best to look for placements for people in all these different industries. And um, we look for placements that are commensurate with people's skills because we don't want people fetching coffee as an assistant for three months. You know, it, the integration is we want, you know, we, we are really serious in terms of like vetting the companies and employers that number one, advocate for you know, newcomer integration. They advocate for diversity and inclusion in the workplace. They advocate for um, equal rights, you know, who believe in human rights. P you know, progressive employers and progressive companies. And I think everyone wants to think that they're progressive and inclusive, right? But, you know, I, you know, my, my job is I, I vet 
everybody, every every employer who says they want to work with us to make sure they're really inclusive or they, they know what it is about. Sometimes they don't really know what diversity and inclusion is. It's such a catchphrase now. It's like a hashtag. Everyone says they want to be, but a lot of them don't know how to put it into practice. So when I um, look at a, a company, I, I interview them and I ask them, do you meet this and this and this, this and this criteria? Um, our, our, our clients are super talented. You know, um, we've been delivering this program for two years. They are really, really impressive. And you know, because with globalization, when you work in media as a journalist in another country or in public relations, a lot of the, the tasks are the, really the same. So our, our clients bring a lot of the hard skills that are commensurate with what is expected here. Whether program delivers is the soft skills, right? The, um, the, the, I guess the acclimatation to the cultural norms. So when I look at the company, I make sure that they, they, um, they hit all the marks, they, they have an inclusive workplace, they're open to work with people who are outside the box, you know, who are, can think, you know, and look at things from a different lens. Um, and in all these different industries that I, I talked about as well. Um, and, you know, I, we've been really successful. We've been really successful for the most part, even during the pandemic in terms of finding opportunities in different industries. Um, you know, the industries that are really hot, I find in the last year that have really um, been really great partners for our program have been the nonprofit industry. Uh, marketing agencies, there, there hasn't been a shortage of work really in marketing agencies. Um, you know, there's a little, bit, a little bit of a slump when the pandemic started, but they've been, there's been a lot of internship opportunities that they've been offering to our clients as well, nonprofit space, um, and new types of journalism. So, you know, there's a, a handful of companies that do podcasts that we've partner with that they gave opportunities to our clients um, for internships. I know you also um, that. And that tells me that journalism is not dead, right. but it's changed. Mm -hmm. And then what Richard said, I really wanted to support what Richard said. Yeah, podcasting I feel is the new, it's, is the new direction of journalism. Are you and, finding, mm -hmm. are you finding uh, some of these um, uh, graduates or students, are they, um, doing their own startups, launching their own um, businesses, or that's a, all that, seeking employment? That, that's a great question. Uh, the majority of them want to be employed, and they understand they need to be employed to get the work reference. And well, first of all, get the Canadian work experience, which is elusive to all of them when they come, um, because you, you got to have some to get some, right? So, um, you know, it just, you know, just traditional employment is really, really important because you want the ex local experience, you want the opportunity to um, develop relationships with local clients, with, with colleagues in your industry locally, uh, to get the work reference, and that will open a lot of doors for you in the future. Um, a few of them do want to start their own company and they come in and say, Daniel, like, when can we get started? Like, I don't, I don't really want to work for anybody else. I have my own company in my country of origin. I've never worked for anybody. And uh, I just want to work for myself. I, I already have an idea what I wanted to do. And I tell them, I'm like, you just dial it down. Like my biggest advice is dial it down. You have to start with everybody, which is like, you have to start working for somebody. The best way to start the company is to work for another successful company where you, know, you can really learn how people do it here. Before you start your own company, you have to learn how things are done here. Mm -hmm. Because the way that you do things in your country of origin may be very different, you know? Not, I'm not talking about just a task, but like business development, getting funders and, and sponsors, yeah. um, regulations, policies could be entirely different here. So you cannot assume that you can, even if you had a successful company or ran a successful agency overseas that, you know, you can just, start, you know, you could just start up immediately based on what you know. Take what you know, but you have to learn how to adapt to the new. And you, you can't adapt without knowing what the new is, which that's, is that's gaining, the, gaining the work experience. That's right. Um, so it's very important. Yes, that's, that's my why, That's why the bridging program is so important. So, mm -hmm. um, I, and, and I, I wanted to actually, about that, um, Richard, you were talking earlier about uh, the pandemic, the fallout, how's that affected, um, I guess, ad revenues. 
uh, across the board, but and 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 you know um, how the media has suffered. But there is also uh, another side to the story. Uh, we also were talking about uh, earlier about powerful media and ventures. There are opportunities in the market. Um, so there, can you sort of weigh it out for us? Um, is there hope at the end of the tunnel, or is there a tunnel? <laughs> I think there are new models that are emerging and, you know, I, like I say, our model has always been delivering eyeballs to or ears to the medium and then advertisers and charging the advertisers. But clearly what's taking its place is subscription based yeah. journalism. So you subscribe to a service and you may end up paying for it. And the question is, how are we going to pay for it? And that's what the Australian situation is about. That's coming on big. It's coming on strong. Also, other new forms of, I mean, the, I could make a very good argument, speaking from Canada, that the, the, the fastest growing media may be Canada Land, their website, and, 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 it may, and that may look like the future of a good chunk of journalism, or even uh, on the other side of the political agenda, Rebel News. Rebel News may be, uh, a, 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 mind you, Rebel News and Canada Land both have their biases, but uh, that may be where things are going. I think if you walk into traditional media, I, and you say to them, I'm adaptable. I, I'll pick up on what Daniel was saying. He's 100% right. Adaptable is critical. If you walk in, if, you, if I'm interviewing someone for a position in a, in a traditional news gathering organization or media organization, I want to hear adaptable. That's really good. And I, when somebody walks in and they say, oh, by the way, I know social media. I know Instagram. I know Twitter. I know Facebook. I know Reddit. I know how to use them. I know how to post things to YouTube. That person will be incredibly valuable to me. So if you come in and you spend some time learning those things or you're adept at them, that will give you a leg up on most people. But again, the opportunity to start new things uh, is out there. And even, let's say, I mean, I've spoken to my students about this. Subscription-based news service, it could be you start off by gathering a group of people and sending them an email with a, it's gotta be, it's gotta be valuable inside news. You send them the inside news uh, and you give them like about six months. And at a certain point, you tell them there's a premium version of this email you're sending them, a stylized e-newsletter. And you say for, for your, your subscription, you'll get this. Now, when you build a larger base of people who are actually reading, either visiting your website to read the news you posted or looking at your email, then it's very possible you're going to find a sponsor or advertiser and it grows from there. There. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know one organization in Calgary, he started out um, um, basically with information and news, and he's become a very successful subscription-based and advertising-based website. He serves the oil and energy industry. Um, it's uh, boereport.com, anybody wants to see it. He's making, he's doing very, very well. He started it from scratch. So he found a niche, which was the oil and energy industry, and he's not only getting advertisers, but he's also a lot of organizations in the in the oil patch subscribe to his public his website. Well, that's what we've seen with the diversification of the media. We've seen that we've now it's no more you know mass market, right? It's it's niche. That's uh, when you target a specific audience, and yep. you know the whole world is your oyster, right? Um, yeah. So I guess that's and and out here in Canada, I, I want to bring something up. I wanted to get your opinion up on this. Um, a lot of newcomers obviously come probably are, um, are familiar or maybe they've grown up in oppressive regimes or not necessarily oppressive, but um, where um, the, 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 there are political powers that control the media uh, as opposed to corporate powers, right? The media, there's always influences, right? Um, and when they come out here, um, how, how you talked about adaptability and how do they adapt because I know the, the, the course that you give through BEMSI uh, that, you, you, um, uh, that you teach, the Ontario media landscape, delves into, into adapting and learning about the, the culture. And I'm just one question, how many people know really about that? Because that's quite important to, to know, you know where you are, where you stand, the freedom, the rights that you have. Um, but how does that all, I know I'm asking a lot of questions at once, but how does all that translate to when it comes to working in the industry? I, I, 
one of the foundational tools we teach both I have a colleague Nava Israel and myself both we talk about is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms under which Canada operates and in the second um, section of the Charter our freedom of expression is outlined and there have been challenges and discussion around that I think it's important to have that fundamental knowledge as well as some of the background documents that have been developed over the years about libel, chill, and, and fear of saying things. Um, we are a fairly open society uh, when it comes to like I, the world press freedom, we, we rank well. Though I do want to caution, it's a personal note that I am somewhat alarmed by what I've been seeing recently in social media and in traditional media where they decide to avoid a story because they don't like its political implications. I don't think we have that option. I think we cover all news, whether we like it or not. And um, I, I, I don't know if this is directly answering your question, but I think someone who can come into being interviewed and says, I'm not carrying bias, I will cover any story, I will write any story. Because if you walk in with this crease in your right and wrong, as, as, as a sly in the family stone used to say, if it's like, this is all good and that's all bad, then you can't cover stuff. So. I want people, and I think people who will succeed are people who are wide awake and alert, yeah, and people who don't take the easy route out. Every time we want to say something's bad now, we use the word racism. And, you know, racism is a particular set of behaviors. It's, for my, for my thinking, it's a disease of the soul. But nonetheless, um, there are certain, and I hear people saying, I don't like the way he parked his car, he's a racist. <laughs> what? You cheapen the term by doing that. You know, the, the term, it has its correct application. So I think people who come into this situation and become, uh, bring in a perspective of looking at things clearly will become very, very important. As somebody who comes in from the outside too, we're only 38 million people here out of over 7 billion on the planet. Somebody can bring me an international perspective. Now, this is just me talking. But I look for that. I want someone who knows what's going on in the rest of the planet. But you see demand for sure um, for that sort of uh, talent. Um, I think it's coming. I think I'm a, I'm ahead of the curve here. Our program's slightly ahead of the curve too. I think there's going to be more and more demand for people who can bring that perspective. People who come into a newsroom and they're not carrying all this baggage about who they will work and work with and who they won't. I worked with extreme left wing and extreme right wing people both. And I'm not saying I'm not one of them, but I, I've worked. And you know, the thing is, just tell the story. Just give me the facts. Just tell the story. I've worked with people with different management styles. As long as they're respectful, I can do that too. And I think that's when you say adaptable, I, when, when, when Daniel's mentioned, you're going to walk into a situation and it may shock you that you thought you were, you're going to be doing one thing and you end up doing another. My first big job with TV Ontario, I thought they'd hired me in the public relations department and it turned out I'd been hired in advertising. They never told me. <laughs> so I came home from my first day on the job thoroughly depressed. I was in advertising. I mean, I made the most of it, but <laughs> you know. Yeah, we have Actually, a comment. I just want to quickly, oh, sorry, Miles. I just want to quickly add to what you said, um, bias. So I think people who grew up here, they have a bias. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're soaked in their culture uh, since they were born here and what they went to school here. But, you know, you naturally develop a bias because you hear the same thing over and over again, right? So people who come from outside of Canada, they, they bring a fresh perspective, which is a lack of bias. Hopefully they bring a lack of bias. I'm sure everyone has bias, right? But hopefully people who come will bring a fresh perspective as, as writers and as news store, as, as uh, storytellers. I always, I call it um, the out of the box thinker. Uh, and it, we, you know, in Canada, we talk about out being out of the box. It's a good thing. It's an asset. We want everyone to think outside the box. Like it's a valuable thing to, to have and to be, right? But what does it really mean? Well, people who come out from outside of Canada, um, they are literally coming from outside the box, which is Canada. So they can bring so much fresh perspective and ideas and ideas how to problem solve. They could see things that we can't because we live in our bias for so long. We're soaked in it, you know? So I, you know, that's why I encourage employers to always look at 
people from outside of Canada. Really, they are your solutions. If you don't want, if you want a new fresh perspective and that's unbiased, look outside the box. This is what's outside the box. And now they're in the box now, but you know, they can bring so much freshness in, into your newsroom and to your audience and really open up new conversations and new audiences as well. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, actually, we have one of our um, uh, one of our um, attendees, uh, Maria. She uh, says, Richard, she completely appreciates your work ethics, ethics, but she says media bias is getting out of control. Just making a statement there. Um, so, and we, we you know we're seeing this um, on the news every day. I guess that's you know uh, that's the way life is, right? We we live among controversies, and that makes the news, doesn't it? Well, let me respond to bias. It's subtle sometimes. I'm getting kind of fed up with CTV news every night referring to pandemic numbers as staggering. Staggering. That's a word I expect from yellow journalism. They could say they're in, they're, they're 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 surprising. They're but I, I I I hear in a lot of our mainstream media some of the stuff we used to affiliate with National Enquirer is creeping in. If you can bring a cool head to these stories, then um, you will have your benefit, you will have your advantage. However, because of the use of purple language like that, ABC News got the best ratings during the pandemic, and I watched their news very, very carefully, and I saw they were using numbers, words like staggering all the time. And instead of somebody saying something or issuing a statement, they trumpeted it. If you don't like someone, you say they trumpeted this. It's their use of <laughs> verbs. So yeah, it's, I would agree. I, I, I sometimes hear stuff and I go, who vetted this? It's so biased in one direction or the other. You know, during the US election, um, I, I was hoping I could find somebody who was giving me the straight up goods without loads of bias, but you get that. And I mean, you get newscasters now who do this thing with their eyebrows, like, oh, they're, <laughs> they're looking askance at something or the poor little puppies. I mean, I, I, I just kind of wish, I just kind of wish that we would just get it straight up. I agree with Maria, there's more, there is a lot of bias. If you can come in and you can vet yourself, strip your bias from what you cover, you're, you're gonna have a huge head start, I think. You know, on that on that point, I, I, on that point, um, like I, you've noticed this year, the the, the 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 most popular word that was hardly used before is the word unprecedented, unprecedented. and everyone is using it left, right, and center, which doesn't really mean much. It just means something that yeah hasn't happened yet, right? It could it's be. Meaning, I, 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 I read an article. Unprecedented. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, uh, like I read an article and something about the sale of watermelons, and they threw that word in. So. Uh, it's, it, it comes to make you think that the people who are actually, um, you know, working on these stories, the journalists, the reporters per se, it's like, do they have a mind of their own or just copying other, they're copying a trend, it's just a trend. We live in an age of, you know, let's follow the trend uh, rather than create a trend, right? Or, or, or you know, pave your own path, uh, just say the truth, speak your mind, analyze, right? And maybe going back to what we were talking about earlier, maybe this is what's needed. Uh, not just here in the West, but everywhere, right? Um, speak your mind, start something new, whether it's a, a you know, a documentary or, or, or news or, you know, but that's what I, I feel, this is the world we've gone too much into um, wanting, delivering what the people want to hear rather than what we want to deliver, right? There's an opportunity too in asking questions and turning them into journalism pieces. Here's one for you. Uh, I, I often tell my students this, if you go into a liquor store and you buy alcohol in, in, in Ontario, there's a, a deposit on every bottle. Most people don't take their bottles back, they put them in the recycling. Um, maybe occasionally the Boy Scouts or Girl Guides will come around and collect the bottles. And, but generally speaking, you're paying that money for those bottles. And I don't, I've never seen a story about where all that money goes, because people are paying it, but they're not getting, getting taking the bottle, bottles back. Stuff like that, asking questions, serious questions about what's taking place in a certain area. That's, that's, that's valuable. Yeah, like it, it, it's funny, like I've worked in places where you had to, and I, and I say this, uh, you know, not very proudly, but where you learn to self-censor yourself because you want to stay alive, right? Um, but out here, you've got freedom, 
to the max. Um, and then people don't even, you know, don't even get to, to, to where you should, you don't even present the facts as they should, or they don't go deeper. You can go deep, you can go wide or high, what you can do whatever, but it just stick to the, to the boring, you know, um, just, you know, tuck, 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 like a typewriter news. Right. And I always wonder why is it that way? Is it the culture? Is it, um, you just want to turn, a, uh, you know, you employed somewhere and you want to just turn the facts around or whatever you have. What is it really? Yeah, I think journalism has gotten pretty lazy. There's a lot of cook, cookie cutter journalism. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I'm tired of all the catchphrases being used, like presidented, pivot. I'm trying to use different like words when I actually have to say those words. I don't, I, I'm trying to find other words to replace them with. Because I, yeah, one of my pet peeves is like overuse of words. I'm not even a journalist. I'm, 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 a, I'm a consumer. I read news, right? And I'm just tired of the same old words, right? There's a lot of cookie cutterness into in, in the industry now. And it, it panders to, it's easy because it's the words that are used before and people respond to it. But uh, I think journalists are pandering to consumers a little too much. Where, where, where are the envelope pushers? Like bring something original that hasn't been kind of questioned, right? And I think the best journalism, it's actually a lot about listening and asking questions. It's the content, there's really not a lot of original content anymore, but there are always original questions. And questions depend on the, the, the consumers, the readers, the viewers, what they want to hear, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for something fresh and, and people to be, you know, even if it's the same content, to ask it in an original way, right? To to raise more eyebrows, you know, to raise more questions, to get people thinking. You know, I think I, I, one of the best examples of what you're talking about, I, I, the Hamilton Spectator, which is the spec.com, the Hamilton Spectator, recognizing that newspapers were in trouble about ten years ago, began this project called um, Code Red. And they basically enhanced and expanded what a newspaper can do. Now, somebody inside the place had to do that. I knew, I know, uh, uh, Quist, he's one of the main writers on this. What, what they did was they said they were going to take census data and economic data about how people lived and economically, how, you know, where they were financially, whether they were poor or well to do. And they started comparing police and ambulance response times to the actual area code, not area code, but postal code where people lived. And they drew some fascinating conclusions and results from that. This is the sort of thing that's original, different, and journalism can do. Now, you, you don't go in with a bias and say, well, we know it's going to be poorer in these communities. You may suspect it, but then they actually pr pr produced, and then they went into the environmental question. I, I remember some journalists in the States took a look at the, where all the toxic dump sites were, and they're all like within like all they're all within about i think two or three kilometers or like 90 percent of them are within two or three kilometers of an african-american population so i mean you gotta start asking yourself like i mean this is the sort of stuff that we can do uh you can do it if you have a bias so that that's magazine writing or you can do it strictly scientifically but some of that stuff is, is interesting and lives an awfully long time on the internet Right. Actually, uh, a note there, the Hamilton Spectator, I just somehow, I think last week I saw um, there, there are some positions there, or there's one or two positions. Yes. Anyone uh, interested, you know, listening to us today, go ahead and, and check that out. I believe it's there. They're looking for a content editor. That's right. That's right. So, and they're a great newspaper. Good organization. I mean, you know, the, we have a tradition in Canada and some of our smaller or middle circulation publications have done tremendous journalism, like Regina Leader Post or the Halifax Chronicle Herald or, or the um, Chronicle News or the uh, Kingston Whig Standard. Some of the, I don't know if the Kingston Whig Standard is doing that anymore, but there used to be a, this tradition of smaller communities doing really, really great journalism. Actually, I want to talk about um, going back. We mentioned about the advertisers and advertising dollars. So um, the industries, you know, basically collapsed, right? Driven, driven by the exodus of these longtime advertisers. And you can see uh, the investments now has turned into the online giants like Facebook, Google, um, and, and, and you know, what have you. So taking that into perspective, 
where does that put your um, you know new age uh, media um, uh, journalists? Where do we go from here? What where, where do Nathan, we? Nathan, you want to go first? You want me to jump in? No, go in, Richard. Yeah. Okay. Jump in, Richard. Yeah. Um, I think um, I I guess the the challenge is. When I look at my Google News feed, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that's really opinion. It's not news. Hmm. I mean, it's, I, 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 today everybody's got an opinion, constant opinion, opinion, opinion. Sometimes I just like the story, please, and I'll take the opinion later. You know, I'll have the gravy on the side, so to speak. Um, so I think in this day and age, okay, there's a couple of opportunities. If Google and Facebook are now going to start using local content. I would be in touch with them to see if there's some way that I can work with them or service them. I can either become a part of their institution or I can provide them with content. I'm not sure how they're going to do this, uh, but I would certainly think there may be an opportunity there. I don't, th I, I think that's one thing you might want to look at. The other thing is a lot of the new startups, because of the role that Google and Facebook and uh, Twitter played in the American election. There are a lot of people starting stuff, new services up now. How many are gonna survive? Probably not many, but it is an environment in which you have an opportunity to start something, particularly if you have a smaller community that you work with. So for example, I was working with a producer who came to me and said, I wanna start a bicycling TV channel. Now, you know, if you, if you know anything about bicycling, it's there's six different types of bicycles or bicycling markets. You know, the BMX people are not the same as the pleasure biker or the person who's got the 25 speed bike, you know, racing downhill. There's all different communities. So I said to him, there's probably not enough content and not enough profit in starting your own TV channel, but you could actually regularly feed stuff. Either you could have an online, uh, a Canadian bicycling blog, or you could actually do a podcast once a week of highlights. And it's got to be stuff that's interesting to all sorts of markets because you can't just each week do one of the six because you'll never get anywhere. So yeah, there are opportunities. There are, as Daniel was referring to before, to these strands or these lanes that we now have, where you have them also in, community, in, in consumer interest. So while I may look at the Globe and Mail for my, and the National Post and the Toronto Star for my general interest information, I'm also looking in my community, I live in Oakville, I'm looking at the Oakville news for, for information, you know, and I will look online, I collect stamps, I'm a stamp collector uh, news site. So there's opportunities all around, not just in the mainstream. You know, that reminds me of um, 20 years ago when uh, the buzzword was globalization, right? Um, I remember interviewing some people at the World Economic Forum and, uh, you know, it was all uh, you have that. You remember the phrase, the catchphrase: "Think global, act local," or "Think, think local, act global," whatever. And HSBC kind of banked on that. No pun intended. Mm. But um, <laughs> so, and, and now we're living that, right? I mean, are these? Are we supposed to, um, you know, think like? Is there like one way this whole globalized world is thinking in one way, one direction? But we're supposed to act locally, or sh should it be think local, act local? Because now you're talking about Google and Facebook. Do they really care about, you know, what sort of what the real content coming from out there or do you just want content for the sake of content? Yeah, I think um, the, the big um, outlets, the big news outlets, they pander to the, the, the big masses. So they're not they're not pandering to the niche audience. Right. So I, mean, I look at I look at TikTok. It really blew like through the roof because kids use it and and they're able to kids are teenagers they're able to build like global audiences by posting pictures of them doing stupid pet tricks and skateboarding and <laughs> you know making you know funny sounds like but they found a niche it's a niche yep. and they found it in a very organic natural way so you know i think as a storyteller whether you're a journalist or content writer find your niche which means find your audience find a specific audience it could be your own community or it could be something like a, a per topic or yeah it's based on a certain topic 
uh, talk about what you know, find an audience that is like you, that you can resonate with and you resonate with them, right? Mm -hmm. And then just listen to them and then ask really good questions. Um, and that's not going to happen in, in big stations. You know what, Bell Media, you know, in Ontario, they just laid off 200 people. That's right. That's right. Like, and so, you know, that's not a place to look anymore. Bell Media and, you know, God bless them, but those big outlets, you know, build your own little audience, you know, and where subscription models and, and advertising is, it's not the focus now. Yeah. Build your audience. If you want to start something or you want to get started in, in, in journalism, build your audience. Do that with podcasts. You could, you could do a podcast on your phone. There's a, there's a clash of, of media. Yeah, yeah, media mentality, like you referred, I guess I, I call it the TikTok generation, but I, I'm not a big fan of TikTok, but, but at least they put, uh, they brought Fleetwood Mac to the younger generation. I like that bit. But, um, but yeah, no, you, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got these struggles, right? I mean, you've got this new generation that wants, you know. Uh, but if you're good, a good storyteller, Daniel's made a good point here. Mm -hmm. If you know how to tell a story, um, it will reverberate in ways you cannot possibly imagine. I always go back to this example of this movie that came out in the early 1990s. It was a film called Once Were Warriors. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. About, about Maoris in New Zealand and the troubles they were facing and the challenges. And so it was meant, it was intended to be a small New Zealand film, but the, the alcoholism and the wife assault, etc., that were portrayed in the film, it went around the world. It made a number of careers. Some people got quite well known from it, but they weren't trying to tell an international story. They were trying to tell a local story and tell it well, and it went around the world. So remember that. Yeah, I remember. It, it, actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned that it aired recently on uh, one of the local channels. Um, so that was like, I actually, uh, yeah. Great film. Yes, yeah, uh, excellent. Low budget too. True, I know. Because um, they were all like, you know, uh, they weren't like, you know, actors. They were, they, actors. they were people from the Maori, from the Maori community. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. They had a good story. They weren't thinking about, oh, I'm going to reach everybody. Eventually did because they were original, authentic. Yeah. Absolutely. There you so, go. Yep. That's all we need to be. Be original, be authentic. Yep. So, I mean, coming to, end, to, to the end, but before I wrap it up, I wanted to just bring it back to Bemsey and um, and uh, also I want your last word on, on, on some advice to, to newcomers and, and uh, what, you know, um, what they could take advantage of. But let me just, uh, I know you had some, um, something to say, uh, some news to announce, but um, I wanted to just, uh, if you can also uh, highlight um, how the program is offered online, because we had a question from one of our uh, attendees and mm -hmm. uh, they were asking if it, also open to newcomers from other provinces. Um, so if you can just uh, explain that to us, please, Daniel. Yes, yeah, so um, unfortunately it is not. It's, um, it's an Ontario funded program. So it's only uh, offered to people who are residents of Ontario. So you need, to be, you, you need to be living in Ontario or you need to be, you know, like the minimum, like have like permanent residence status in Ontario. Now, actually, I'll give you a funny story. If you have PR status here, but you're not living in um, Ontario, if you're in another province right now, but you, your status is, your PR is in Ontario, or if you're living outside of Canada right now, um, you can still attend the program. For instance, we have one uh, participant who got her PR status, but she's doing a contract right now in Bangkok and Thailand. Crazy. She's still taking it. God bless her. She's taking it, you know, like with a twenty with a twenty four hour um, like uh, time difference. No, no twelve hour time difference right now. Um, but she's she was still she's able, still able to take the course with us. It's all virtual, so that's uh, that's good news for most people because it cuts down on travel and things like that. Um, yes, but you need to you need to have your residence status in Ontario in order to take it right now. Mm -hmm. um, it is one hundred percent virtual. Um, it's not the same as, I'm not going to lie, it's not the same as being in person. We hope that we could get to that point, you know, by, you know, by the end of this year again. But, you know, by gosh, we, we try really, really hard to create a great virtual environment, a professional environment. Richard can attest to that. Miles can attest to that as well. Um, but even even uh, when I just, I want to just um, 
uh, add to that, that even if we go back to uh, offering this in person once COVID is, is over and we're all safe to do so, we still have that virtual element. So it's offered online as well as in, uh, you know, in person in a classroom. So it is, yes. That's, that's the beauty of this. It's quite unique. And, you know, you get to um, uh, listen to Richard uh, <laughs> uh, enlighten us for, for a good two months. What we attempt to do is give people tools that when they go into a newsroom or any setting, people say, you've lived in Canada all your life, you must have. And they go, no, <laughs> we can inside information. Yeah. And we got it at Pepsi, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we have a question, but one more thing you, I want you to add, um, you said you have, there's something to, um, that you've added to the, to the curriculum, um, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Tell us what, what to expect for those who are um, interested in, in signing up to the program. Yeah, so our, with the upcoming um, cohort, we're adding a new course, podcasting. Now we used to have podcasting um, as I think it was like a guest speaker come in. He was a professional podcaster. Um, he was he's also an instructor at Humber College uh, for podcasting. So um, he he uh, was a guest speaker. But there's so much content that we couldn't capture in the guest speaking day. So now we're actually creating a. He's helping us create a, a course in our program. It's going to be the three maybe two to three day course. Um, because podcasting, it's, it's work. It's, it's, it could be paid work, you know, it's valid work. Um, and it's so important for people to know that this is an option. You can take your experience in journalism and you can do something on a podcast. When people are not hiring you, start your podcast, get started there, build your audience and it will grow. And then build your credibility with your podcast and your audience. Um, so that's, a, we're really excited about that partnership with this instructor. Uh, in podcasting, um, we're also we're, we're 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 trying to follow the times and what people want to know. Like digital content is everything right now, so we added a you know um, guest speaking uh, engagements with um, uh, with CEO like um, search engine optimization. That's also a hot topic, so we're adding that to our content in uh, in a larger degree as well. So these are the areas our, our program is growing. We're trying to keep up with the times. I know Richard definitely teaches about traditional journalism, but also about web journalism and, when, and, um, and just how, how the industry is changing as well. Um, and yeah, digital content is the wave of the future and different streaming platforms. We're covering all that in the upcoming cohort in, in a bigger degree. Yeah, I, uh, thanks Daniel. I am um, going to, um... I have just uh, added the link to the info session for BMC, so feel free uh, to check that out. Also, all that information is on our website, uh, mlct.org. You can find out more about the bridging programs. Um, there's another bridging program that we also um, um, offer. It's uh, in the mental health field, but um, but this one is quite unique at the media because I don't think many people are doing this. Um, we have a question actually from Sally. And she basically is, um, wants to ask us about uh, any suggestions that of finding work because she says the, uh, the pandemic has changed job hunting and the old methods may not work so well anymore. So even networking is not as effective and that's pretty obvious, you know, no more face to face in person um, interaction. I mean, I find that quite uh, challenging. I'm more of a, you know, I like to be there in person and see people and feel the energy in the room. And, you know, rather than a two dimensional screen. So um, she's asking like what suggestions or what, what recommendations on, uh, you know, finding work, where should she be looking in these strange times? Well, two, two bits of advice. One is brand yourself well, right? So brand yourself well, find your niche, brand yourself well on LinkedIn, on your website, on the blog, right? And then build an audience there. Yeah, on social media even, and engage with your followers and people who follow you and ask questions, engage with them. Some of them may be future employers. Some of them may be, maybe if not traditional employers, people who could give you contract work as a writer and things like that. And number two, mentorship is really, really important. And mentorship is finding that one person in the industry um, right now that is, uh, has a little more experience than you, who, who is basically you, um, who that, sorry, who you want to be in like five years. 
right? And someone that you can model yourself after, build a relationship with that person um, and learn everything you need to learn about how they got into the industry, how they thrived in the industry, how they stayed in the industry through all these transitions, right? Um, and it's about relationship building. It's not about asking for a job, but you know, I just, I, I, was, uh, I was told recently, one of my clients, their mentor actually got them a job. After a few years of getting to know each other and coaching and their mentor obviously was well networked in the industry. They knew someone was hiring. They told you know, their mentee and boom and the bang, the connection was made and they were able to find a job. So mm -hmm. I think mentorship is so important. And a mentor, a good mentor is someone who has your back as well. How do you, how do you find a mentor if you're not gonna go through a program like this? Find that you could find one yourself. You could you know, use it through networking, through LinkedIn, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you can go through, there's um, a lot of community um, service providers that offer mentorship programs. Um, for specific industries as well. Um, BMC, uh, one of our partners is Seneca College. So they am, you know, they uh, are a partner of TRIEC, right? Um, and both of them have created a wonderful mentorship um, uh, program. And they, they partner with our, our program, BMC, to provide our participants with mentors if our participants choose to, to, to enroll in that program as well. Um, it's all part of our program. It's all free of charge. And, and our clients have really, really benefited from, you know, finding a mentor, those who have participated in the program. In, in teaching, I also encourage the students to join, affiliate with organizations that can further them. For example, Women in Film and Television Toronto, very good organization. Um, uh, the Academy.ca, Academy.ca is for people going into film and television. Uh, I, there's print organizations, there's the IABC, there's the, um, uh, uh, the CPRS, Canadian Public Relations Society. So we give our, our students a list of organizations to belong to. Uh, and some of them actually are there, our people are participants, but they get in on a student rate sometimes, etc. So uh, it, that's a good place to affiliate and meet people and find someone who might become your mentor. Mm -hmm. But we have a just a quick question here. Um, it's uh, Preeti is asking about. Uh, she's a permanent resident um, uh, and she resides in Ontario. Uh, but if she travels outside of Canada, where she's might be, you know, there for a few, couple of months, can she stay <laughs> with the BMC program? Daniel. Yes, I mean, as long as your your PR status is in Ontario, you could be around the world, like one of our. Our, our, our current um, students is and still take the program. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, excellent. I know we've gone a little bit overboard, uh, 10 minutes, but it's, it's you know, um, it's, it's such a pleasure to, to speak to both of you. I wanted, um, as a closing note, Richard, <laughs> just to get your opinion on the media in general. Um, I know this is a big question, but do you, do you, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you excited about the future of the media? How do, how do you feel? I mean, you've seen it, you know, you've been in the media for so long um, and you will quite be here frankly, for a long time, but what, how do you- Frankly, I think the news media are probably at their lowest point in North America that I, I've ever seen in terms of clarity of reporting and honesty and keeping news and opinion separate. I think the only place to go is up, but anybody who goes in and understands that will be in a good shape. Generally speaking, media overall, there's a shuffle going on. Disney Plus is now in the picture. Netflix realizes they have to spend some money in Canada. I mean, I think they're probably taking about $500 million in subscription fees in Canada every year. So they got to put something back in. I mean, you, know, you hope you don't have to legislate that. So. Uh, with regards to news media, I think we're going to see a flourishing of a lot of locally based and uh, thematically based, uh, interest based new media, uh, which will all be on the on the Internet. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. I think that's what we're witnessing right now. So the legacy media are having their challenges, but I expect to see a lot of new uh, web-based media and some of them are going to survive and do well i think like i mentioned canada land is a good example yeah no i, I guess it's it's all about um one 
someone needs to take the initiative, right? Uh, drive that change. And it takes guts as well, right? Yep. Um, but when you say the only way is up, there is a lot of opportunity. Yep. Uh, um, and, and when you come here with a fresh mind, different perspective, uh, just go for it, I guess, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, really appreciate your time today and your knowledge and your expertise sharing it with us. Uh, hopefully we'll have <clears throat> other sessions like this. Um, and uh, for um, our Men Like New Life Center, we just don't talk about me. I mean, media is not the only thing that we do <laughs> or bridging programs. Um, we're also an organization that uh, offers settlement um, uh, services as well as uh, mental health counseling uh, for groups, individuals, communities. Um, uh, we, uh, and so we're involved on many levels, uh, even um, uh, anti-human trafficking. So um, on the screen there, if you wanna connect with us, connect with the bridging program, um, so feel free to either call us, email us, um, uh, and we'll be more than happy to connect with you. Uh, Daniel as well, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's in that BEMC program with yep. the, and, he, and, he, and you run the info session. So if you're interested, please join that info session, sign mm -hmm. up for it and we'll go from there. Great. So thank you guys. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thanks for having us, Miles. Absolutely. A real and pleasure. Thank you, both of you. You're more than welcome. Stay safe. Enjoy the uh, the good weather coming. <laughs> Unprecedented <laughs> weather. <laughs> I'll pivot to that. I'll pivot to that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Day. Take care, everybody.